Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Easter Rally webinar 2020. This is our second night and our second meeting today. And not only are we about to hear another message from Kenneth tonight, but also from Stina, another children story. And we will hear from two of our alumni tonight again. And the Sabbath is approaching. So we have the privilege to spend this time together, to start the Sabbath together. I hope your preparations went well today. Um, I invite you to pray with me to consecrate ourselves and this gathering that we are having here to the Most High. So pray with me, please, now. Lord, Father in heaven, the creator of the universe and the one who instituted the Sabbath for us, thank you that your temple of time is approaching and we can enter into the Sabbath rest by your grace. Father in heaven, we are gathering in a special way like people have not imagined they, people would gather the past few thousand years. But here we are in different countries listening and being inspired by your messages, by your truths. We pray, dear Father in heaven, that you may bless the children as they will hear the story from Stina. We would like to ask your blessing upon Adam and Kate that will share a testimony today. And we would also like to you to anoint the tongue of Kenneth that will speak with us, to us. Father in heaven, may you please bless our hearts, open our hearts and give us heavenly wisdom and understanding to discern right from wrong and to be inspired deep in our hearts. We pray in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, before we continue, I would just uh, to remind you shortly of uh, Slido, slide.do. Um, this is the, your opportunity to write down questions that we'll have answered in the last meeting in the Q&A session on Monday. So make use of this of this um, possibility and opportunity. So and now, Stina, um, will you begin with the som du har prepared for for Bana? Yeah. Hi, alle barn. I dag så har jeg med mig to venner, og de to venner mine, de heter Emma, og så er det Nia. Og før jeg skal fortælle dere en historie i dag, så skal vi synge dere en sang om at det er så fint i himmelen. För att hun Ellen, hun jenta som jag berättar om, hun var väldigt glad i himlen och vi har också väldigt lust att komma till himlen. Så nu ska vi synge lite om den sangen. En dag var jag i dyrehagen och så många tyckte det var skatt. Nu en snille, nu en ville, nu en som stod på var. Det ville ju vara nu, vi skulle ta med var. Och kom till mig och flykte dig, för att jag farlig var. Jag tänkte vår fint i himlen, vår alla glad och fri. För ingen vet, för ingen slott. Og Gud har bor med oss. En annen dag var jeg i byen, Og så mange folk ut av skatt. Noen snille, noen ville, Noen som stod på vakt. Det ville jo være nå, Hvis alle elsket meg. Og elsket Gud og holdt hans bud, og gikk på himmelens vei. Ja, tenk deg hvor fint i himmelen, hvor alle er glad og fri. For ingen bit er ingen slott, og Gud har bor med oss. Og så synger vi, og så synger vi det her refrenget en gang til. Jag tänkte vår fint 
For i dag så skal jeg fortelle dere en annen liten spennende historie. Men før jeg forteller dere den historien, så har jeg lyst til å si en bitte liten bønn om at Gud må være med oss barna også på det her møtet. Kjære gode far i himmelen, tusen takk for at vi barn kan være sammen og at vi kan få lære mer om deg i dag i den historien vi skal høre. I Jesu navn. Amen. Husker dere at jeg fortalte dere om Ellen i går, den jenta som fikk den der steinen i ansiktet, og som liksom ble litt sånn at hun ikke så så fin ut lenger, men så var Gud glad i henne likevel. Husker dere at jeg fortalte om det i går? Og vet du hva? Hun var en veldig snill jente, hun lille Ellen. Hun ville så gjerne følge Jesus, skjønner du? Og så begynte hun å gå på noen sånne møter hvor de fortalte masse om Jesus. Og så vet du hva de fortalte på de møtene? De sa at Jesus kommer igjen veldig snart. Og det tenkte Ellen, jeg har så lyst til å være med. Men så tenkte hun på alt det gale hun hadde gjort, og så tenkte hun... Kanskje ikke jeg er bra nok, jeg tror ikke jeg er bra nok til å være med Jesus i himmelen, jeg har gjort så mange gale ting. Og så vet du hva, så tenkte hun på det så mye, at hun ble så veldig lei seg. Hun klarte nesten ikke å sove om natta, for hun tenkte bare på at kanskje ikke jeg er klar når Jesus kommer igjen. Og hun turte nesten ikke å si det til noen heller da. Til slutt så sa hun det faktisk til broren sin. Og så vet du hva? En natt så fikk hun en drøm, og den drømmen tror jeg det var Gud som sendte til henne. Vet du hva hun drømte i den drømmen? Hun drømte at det kom en mann inn til henne der hvor hun satt og var så veldig lei seg. Og så sa den mannen til henne, vil du gjerne se Jesus? Og det var akkurat det hun hadde sittet og tenkt på. Hun hadde tenkt på at hvis Jesus bare var her på jorda, så ville jeg bare kaste meg inn i armen hans. Og så ville han sikkert hjulpet meg. Så hun visste jo det at Jesus på en måte, så visste hun det at Jesus var glad i henne. Og det er veldig viktig, det var det vi lærte i går. Veldig viktig å vite at Jesus er glad i oss. Men hun følte seg så skitten. Og så sa den mannen om hun ville se Jesus, så sa hun, ja, det vil jeg. Og så sa han mannen, da må du pakke sammen alle de små tingene dine i en liten koffert, og så må du komme med meg. Og det gjorde hun, hun var kjempeglad for å komme. Og vet du hva? Da begynte de å gå opp over en veldig bratt sånn her stige, som gikk høyere og høyere og høyere og høyere. Og det var veldig bratt ned. Og han mannen hadde sagt til henne, du kan ikke se ned. For hvis du ser ned, så blir du svimmel, og så faller du av stigen, for det var mange som hadde falt av den stigen før. Men hun hadde så lyst til å se Jesus at hun så bare oppover, oppover, oppover. Og så kom hun høyere og høyere opp, helt til hun liksom kom opp der hvor det var et gulv. Og da sa man, nå skal du få se Jesus. Og så åpnet han en sånn dør. Og så vet du hva hun så innenfor den døren? Innenfor den døren så så hun Jesus. Og han så så snill ut. Hun tenkte, jeg har aldri sett noen så snille før. Og hun skjønte liksom med en gang at han var glad i seg henne og følte seg så mye bedre. Fordi at det står jo det i Bibelen, vet dere, at Jesus han tar gjerne imot syndere. Så det er bare dumt å gå og være så veldig lei seg hele tiden. Det er riktig å være lei seg når man har gjort noe galt. Men hvis man bare går og er lei seg og ikke går til Jesus og får tilgivelse, da blir det jo bare trist. Så hvis vi har gjort noe dumt og slemt, så er det bra at vi er lei oss for det. Men da må vi gå til Jesus med en gang, for da ser han på oss sånn fint som han så på Ellen. Og så sier han at jeg vil hjelpe deg. Og så vet du hva? Vet du hva som skjedde da? Da lå Ellen bare der, og så var hun liksom så lykkelig at hun kunne nesten ikke se opp. Og så før hun skulle gå ned igjen, så sa Jesus til henne, så tok han en sånn tråd. Kanskje den ligner litt på den tråden som jeg har her. Se på den tråden, det er en sånn fin grønn tråd. Og så sa han til henne, den tråden skal du ta, sa han. Og den skal du ta med deg, og så skal du ha den nær inntil hjertet ditt. Og så hver gang du vil se Jesus, så skal du strekke ut den grønne tråden sånn her. Men han sa, ikke hold den inne ved hjertet ditt alt for lenge, for da blir den liksom krøllet og sånn. Og da er det vanskelig å strekke den ut igjen. Og vet du hva det betydde? 
Det betyder att det är er viktigt att vi har kontakt med Jesus varje dag när han har tillit synderna våra. Så är er det viktigt att vi har kontakt med han varje dag och det gör vi när vi ber till han och snackar med Gud för han vill så gärna snacka med oss. Så den gröna tron var liksom den troen vi har på Jesus att han kan svara på bönorna våra så och hjälpa oss att göra det som är er riktigt. Ja, det synes jeg var en väldigt fin historie. Så nu har jeg lyst til å vise dere hva dere kan göra for en aktivitet mens at, jeg, mens, at, mens at Kenneth snakker med og de andre snakker med de voksne. Dere kan ta en sån grön tråd. Hvis ikke dere har akkurat sån grön tråd som jeg har, så kan du jo bare finne en annen grønn tråd. Hvis dere ikke har grønn tråd, så kan dere sikkert ta en annen farge også. Og så kan du ta sånne ting som dere kan lage nok. Jeg viser dig vad jeg har. För det att det här är er liksom tron på att Gud kan svara bönor, ikke sant? Och då kan det för exempel så har jag fått ett sånt väldigt fint kort av han Elias som var med sång igår som jag synes är er väldigt kosligt. Och hvis jag vill huske på och be för Elias så kan jag ta ett lite limbon och så kan jag klistra det kort jag har fått av Elias till den gröna tråden. Sån här. För då kan jag liksom hänga upp den tråden ett sted, och så kan jag huske på att jag ska be för Elias. Och så har jag en bästa min i Australien som här är er ute på cykeltur med henne så hvis jag vill tänka på att det liksom jag vill be för henne så kan jag klistra den på där också på den gröna tråden, ikke sant? Så kanske det har bilder av någon som det är er glad i som det har lyst til att klistra på där som det vill be för. Och så en nok då han har sent mig en sån hon som han har skrivit till tante på. Och så då kan jag tänka på en och när jag ser den honen så då kan jag klistra den på och så har jag ett liten ting till som jag syns är er väldigt fint att klistra på då. Och det är er det här som jag har skrivit till Jesus där står det tack för att du älskar mig för det är er inte liksom bara att be för ting heller vi kan tacka Gud också så det kan vi också klistra på den där i tråden och då kan dere prøve att göra det lite barn men dere hör på mötena och så tänker på att det som är er väldigt viktigt först husker du igår det är er att Jesus är er glad i oss Och när vi ser att Jesus är er glad i oss så tør vi ju komma till han med det gale vi har gjort och be om tillgivelse och så kan han säga si, till dig och jag vill hjälpa dig till att hålla kontakt med mig och be till mig så att vi kan vara vänner. Var ikke det fint? Så då barn, då må dere ha en jättefin kväll. Och så en annan ting jag må bara se jag ska bara nämna en ting till som kanske är er väldigt lurt att klistra på den tråden. Det är er ett bild av det Jesus gjorde för oss på korset för det att det är er ju nog vi kan vara väldigt tacksämliga för att han döde för oss så att vi i det hele tatt kan liksom få tillgivelse då. Så det var det jag ville dela med dere i kväll. Och så må dere ha en jättefin sabbat och så ses vi imorgon kväll, ikke sant? Ha det bra då.
is mighty and great and he will help you if you believe be faithful and wait for it has never happened that he has come too late hear us can you give us a thumb thumbs up okay good so we are going to share with you um a testimony each and first of all my name is Ket and I was a student at Matheson in year 2017 to 2018 and during that time I really had to learn to step out of my comfort zone um i had to learn to do things that yeah that i didn't really know how to do to to dare to go into situations where i felt i didn't have control and in the beginning it was very challenging but i discovered that uh, matheson is a safe place to grow and growing i did and um during during my year at matheson I was asked to um, to stay uh, to be a leader in a lifestyle club. And for those of you who don't know what a lifestyle club is, um, it is a outreach project where we arrange health seminars, cooking courses, races, health expos, and yeah, many things more. And being a leader in lifestyle club first of all meant that i had to be a leader uh, and it also meant that i had to speak in front of many people which i didn't really feel comfortable with and also thinking about these things made me nervous uh, and <clears throat> i am a nurse 
So I know things about diseases, healthcare and stuff like that, but I did not know how to arrange health seminars. Uh, I didn't like cooking, I didn't like running, and I was just wondering how can I inspire people to cook healthy food and to exercise more and uh, things like that. And also I was thinking, how will people listen to me when, well, how will they listen to a 20 something year old a woman and they were thinking that I was just a 16 year old girl so there were many things like that and I was so nervous thinking like what will they think about me and how will I give them what they expect and things like that so I thought to myself that these people they are crazy for asking me to do this job but I also felt that God was saying just do it so I did and saying yes was as you can imagine, um, yeah, it was scary. I had to go into something I didn't know much about. And many days I was just praying, God, I don't know how to do this, but if you do, so please help me. And along the way, I, um, yeah, I was afraid of looking stupid in front of people. But what I discovered was that God, he, he, um, he gave me the knowledge that I needed uh, which reminds me of this beautiful quote by Ellen White in Ministry of Healing, I think. And it says, he is able and willing to bestow upon his servants all the help that they need. He will give them the wisdom which their varied necessities demand. And I experienced that this is so true. When we are asked to do um, something that we don't know much about then god he will give us the knowledge and the wisdom that we need and at matheson and i'm sure that many people that have been at matheson or are, are at matheson now that they will uh, know the following sentence very well because many times at matheson um this sentence were said god does not call the qualified he qualifies the called and um yeah, again, I believe that this is so true. And since Matheson, I have been asked to do things I don't feel qualified for. Uh, but trusting that God would help me, I realized that being qualified or not wasn't the question. The question was if I was willing to um, be used by God or not. So I want to encourage everyone who is listening to dare to trust God when you are called to do something. Um, don't be afraid that people will laugh at you or don't be afraid that you won't give what people expect you to give. Just trust God and he will give you the knowledge that you need. And when you do that, you will experience so many blessings. I really have experienced so many blessings when I have decided to just step out of my comfort zone. So that's what I want to share with you. And um, now I think Adam wants to, yes. to share something he has experienced. Yes. So I was a student at Matheson from 2014 to 2015. And then I worked there for three more years, I think. And um, one of the things that I really learned at Matheson is to be genuine and honest um, with your own struggles, with your own thoughts, to um, to dare, to dare to think. And um, that's really helped me after I've le left Matheson. I found my fiance at Matheson, which is a very, I'm very happy for. And, um, but the thing is what I've realized is that being in the relationship, God has used it to show some of the more hidden sides of my personality or my hidden sides of my character. And one of them was that I was very critical to the people around me, that what people did was never good enough in my eyes for some reason. I would come across as quite critical. And um, I saw that that, that helped people, hurt, that hurt the people that I cared for. And um, I think being at Matheson gave me the wish to work out why, why, why is this, 
why is this happening? Where is this coming from? To try and get to the bottom of it. And um, what I'd found was that I was quite legalistic in my thinking and that how I was treating others was basically the way I saw God treating me, um, basically. And so I prayed a prayer. I remember, like, I was talking to Kat and I was in tears because it was just, um, it was very difficult to, to, to realize that I just didn't accept the fact that God loved me for who I was. So I prayed a prayer to God to, to save me from legalism. And um, the last six months has been some of the hardest months of at least my life, maybe yours also. <laughs> but um, it's a prayer which I really believe God has been answering. Um, I really believe so. Um, I got the idea to start studying the book of Romans and it's just been so amazing to experience um, the unconditional love of God for, for me, regardless um, of who I, of, of, of what I do. And it's been really nice to see how it's affected. It's been really nice to see the practical difference it makes also in my relationship and the way I relate to others. I enjoy people more. I enjoy life more. I enjoy reading the Bible more. It's easier for us just to have spiritual conversations because I don't feel like it's a duty. I just feel like it, it's just nice. And um, yeah, it's just been it's just been a nice experience, which I'm still going through. But it's just really nice that God would do that for me. Actually, it's really nice. So um, yeah. And I think Matheson was a big part to play in that because it taught me to, to dare to think and to dare to, to tackle the things which are in us, but we, are, we often don't give, give time or thought to. So um, yeah, I wanna, I wanna thank Matheson actually for, for giving us that. In
Ja. Okay, can you hear me, guys? Cool. No, there is a problem here. Hello? We can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm pressing the buttons. Nothing is happening here. Yes. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> so I'm supposed to start the slide presentation. PowerPoint. Alt tab, isn't that the command? F5. There it is coming. Oh no. The whole <laughs> thing is gone now. <laughs> Must be a conspiracy behind this. Uh, shall I try to upload it again? I have no clue what is happening here. Resume uh, share. Cool. Uh, okay. I'm working full time here and I'm sweating. No, things are happening here now. Okay. Here we have. Why in the world did that come up here? Okay. No, it should come up. Yeah. And then. Uh, somebody is calling me here. Yeah. Yeah, hello, hello. Hello. Yes. Okay, wonderful. I uh, hope you can all hear me. I just test if I can go back and forth. Yeah, I hope you can all hear me and uh, good night. Like, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for uh, having me on. And uh, the team for, uh, for this uh, rally is prepared for the end time. And uh, I'll have a short prayer as we are beginning here. Uh, dear Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, do we come before you? We thank you so much for, um, for all your graces, most of all for your Bible and for uh, Jesus Christ who came to this world to save the lost. And uh, we pray now for your Holy Spirit to take control over the situation and guide us and lead us, for we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yes, yes, good evening. And uh, this uh, team is prepared for the end time. Really, to be honest, we are living in the end time, and we have been living in the end time for 200 years. So uh, we are really preparing for the last days of the end time. We have come now to a very, very special time in history. Uh, and we are all experiencing this uh, corona virus and it's something scary and it's something that reminds us that we are living in apocalyptic times uh, we uh, all worry to a certain degree but uh, the more important it is to be surrendered to the lord of course because in the last days before Jesus comes back, there will be deceptions of all kinds. And uh, the Bible speaks very clearly about these deceptions. For instance, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says clearly, take heed that no one deceives you. So there will be deceptions in this world. And when we go to the book of Revelation and we look at the the 13th chapter there that we will do later on. It speaks about the mark of the beast. It speaks about uh, a new world order. 
and every person in the world has to submit to the commands that is coming from above somewhere. And this is really a time of crisis. And we get a little taste of it today as we have this coronavirus uh, going all over the world. And what do we do? How do we prepare for, for, for these times that are coming? Of course, I could say we need to move out to the countries to, to live country life, lifestyles, move away from the big cities, couple of hours, cut all connections with the worldly people. I could also say become a vegetarian or even a plant-based Christian. And I would say also stop sinning. Stop sinning because the sins are really that hinders God, God to, to, to bless us. And in order to stop sinning, we have to surrender to the Lord, of course. Because if we start to, to reform our lives and, and try to, to live holy lives without, without the blessings of the Lord, without doing it in the right way, it's just vain. All of it is vain because we are helpless against the virus called sin. So what I find in the Bible is that God is communicating with us. Many people, they want to be saved by Jesus, but without the Bible. They want to make Jesus a sweet savior in their minds and in their imagination. And therefore, actually, they manipulate Jesus to become the one Jesus they want. So it doesn't become the, the gospel according to Matthew and John and, and Luke. It becomes the gospel of Mr. Nielsen or Jensen or Jorgensen or whatever. And this is technically speaking called spiritualism. That is when, when your own spirit is deciding what way we should go instead of listening to the word of God. Because to prepare for the end time or the last days of the end time will be to, the most important is to connect with God. And uh, you know that it says about Jesus that the word became flesh. The word became flesh and we call him Logos. So we cannot disconnect the word of God from Jesus Christ. And without Jesus Christ, it is impossible to be saved in these last days. So we need to connect with Jesus Christ through the Bible. And, uh, and therefore, we must be eager Bible students. And I tell you, if we don't know the book of Daniel, we cannot understand the challenges in the book of Revelation. We cannot understand the mark of the beast and who, who the beast is and all these terrible things that will happen just before Jesus comes back. We have to start there in the book of Daniel. And I think personally, and you may disagree with me, I think the best way to prepare for the very last days is actually to get to know the special prophetic message God has for these last days. And in order to understand that last message from God, in his special books, the Daniel and Revelation, we must start at the beginning. We must start to, 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 to build on the knowledge we already have. And then we can start to search for more complex chapters. And it takes time to learn these things. And, you know, we are going into a terrible war soon. Satan will unleash his powers and he will make a terrible warfare against uh, people in this world, especially those who, who are insisting on keeping the Sabbath. And, and this warfare, we need to have a certain insight into this warfare. It is described there in Daniel and Revelation. So it's not only a question of moving out in the countryside and becoming a vegetarian and, and do all the right things. It's also a question of connecting with the Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we do through the Bible, because Jesus speaks to us through the Bible and through his Holy Spirit. So 
this is my humble attempt to encourage you to study the prophecies. You now, when the Matheson School started 30 years ago, it was because we had a revival there. There was also a reformation, and we saw wild, big sinners coming to the Matheson School, and we studied Daniel and Revelation, and something happened in our hearts. And El Mites even says that when we come together to study the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation, there will be a revival and a reformation among us. So I don't excuse for, for taking up this topic of, of Daniel 7, because it's foundational to understand the, the dramas of the, last, of the last days and hours in this world. So therefore, I, we start here 2,500 years ago, again, in the time of Daniel, in the Babylonian Empire. And this time, um, Daniel, he had, a, he had a dream, and he was dreaming, uh, dreaming uh, incredible things, not only, uh, not only Daniel, we know also that uh, that uh, the king had a had a great a great uh, vision uh, in chapter two, but this time Daniel he has a dream and a vision, and he was in his bed and he saw strange things. And we remember last time the king had a dream, and God let Daniel see that dream and explaining that dream for the king, and the king was very impressed and it. It brought him closer to God, and, and, and he understood what right theology is. That's from the Hebrews. It's not from the Babylonian theologians. So Nebuchadnezzar's mind was changed, but he still had to, to, to go through uh, cleansing and sanctification before he was ready. He was ready to, to, to be surrendered completely to the Lord. We will take the curtain aside. We will see into what has been mysteries. And uh, we are reading there from Daniel chapter, chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. There are other facts to the story. And on the other side of at the, in the other, uh, in, at the other side of eternity, we will have the opportunity to talk to Daniel. And I'd like to ask him, what more was there to that dream you gave in Daniel chapter 7? In this dream, he saw seven animals, four animals coming up from the sea. These animals were fierce animals, not animals you can, you know, not animals that were clean according to the list in, in, um, Leviticus chapter 11, but these were unclean animals and they were fierce animals, animals that were eating other animals. And uh, the first was like a bear, uh, sorry, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, Daniel says in, in, the, in verse 4. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. This was the lion. Very clear description of this, this animal, a lion, uh, the king of the animals with eagle's wings. Eagle, the eagle is the king of the, of the birds. So we're very royal, a very... A very special animal and of course it is a symbol it's not the real thing Who, whoever ha, ha, has anyone in this world seen a lion with wings it's impossible so it's very surrealistic it means it's a symbol of something and behold there was a beast the second like to a bear and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. The next animal Daniel was seeing in his dream was a, was a bear. And it was big, huge, and it was powerful. And it had three ribs in its mouth. And it was rising up, the Bible says, more on one side than the other. 
and it was eating much flesh. And these three ribs, they mean something. And then after this, I behold an, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads and dominion was given to it. Yeah, this is also a very strange construction, uh, a double set of wings and a leopard, very quick, speedy animal with four heads, totally abnormal, totally surrealistic. And yet it is a symbol of something. And then after this, I saw in the night visions, verse seven, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong and exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse, sorry. It was diverse, diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. It had 10 horns. Let me see if I can move this. Yeah, so I can eat more easily see it. It had 10 horns. This animal was grotesque. There was no similar animal to the characteristics of, of this than in the animal world. So God had to construct something different, something entirely different. It's like a T-Rex uh, di dinosaur, so to speak. And it had 10 horns on its head. And uh, Daniel paid attention to the 10 horns. And we see that these four animals are very parallel to the four metals in Daniel chapter 2. And there is a perfect parallel, actually, between the animals and the metals. And this is God's way to teach us, just starting first with something simple and then going on to something more complex and more focused on the last days. So gold is the most precious of the four metals. Likewise, the lion is the most precious, the king of the animals. And then the silver and then the other uh, metals and the same with the animals. So what, what does this animal, what do they mean? Or what does it mean, this thing? Yeah. It means that uh, the first kingdom is Babylon, the next is Medio Persia, the next is Greece, and then Rome. And this is the succession of empires from the time of Daniel that is actually universally accepted by all historians. You can go to any world history and trace the history where God's people are located and trace it from the days of Daniel. And you'll see you will end up with Babylon, Medio Persia, Greece, and Rome. And therefore, all Christians in history have, 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 been, have agreed on this interpretation. It is very basic. And if you don't see this when you read Daniel, you will not understand the book of Revelation. I promise you. I promise you. The last is the fourth animal. Uh, uh, signifying the Roman Empire. The lion, of course, is Babylon. And the two wings uh, represents also a combination of the king of the animal, uh, the, 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 the king of the, of the birds and the king of the animals, the lion with the eagle wings. And a heart was given to that animal, according to the text, and a, and a human heart. And that could signify when, when the leader of that country, Nebuchadnezzar, actually surrendered to God. And I think his policies also changed. So therefore the lion received a human heart. The bear rose up on one side more than the other. That's the combination of two empires, the Medes and the Persians, because first the, the Medes were the most powerful and then the Persians came and, and Cyrus lifted them up and even beyond the, the, the Medes, the, the, the Medes, and the three ribs were the three uh, empires, kingdoms that it conquered, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. So the bear is a tremendous, wonderful uh, symbol of the Babylonian empire. Likewise, the Greeks, 
the Greeks represented with the leopard the fastest animal of these fierce animals. And Greece conquered the world through Alexander the Great in a very short time, 10 years. The four wings is a powerful illustration to that. And the four heads are the division between the, uh, the division of four of, of, of uh, the original empire to Alexander the Great. Later, it, it three dominated, three kingdoms dominated, but it started to be divided into four, four empires, Thracia, Macedonia, Syria, and Egypt. And then after that, we come to the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire had 10 horns signifying the 10 tribes, barbarian tribes coming from the north, uh, not, not in order to conquer the Roman Empire, but to have better living conditions. So out of personal needs, they, 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 uh, need, they, they moved south. Today, they moved north from Africa and the Middle East. So things are a little different today. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and the mouth speaking great things. Did you know that all previous interpreters in the, in the early church, they believe this is the Antichrist. And this has been a firm belief to millions of Christians throughout the ages. As a matter of fact, this is the first time we really get to know the Antichrist in the Bible. And if we love Jesus Christ, we would be happy to know who his enemy, who his, his enemy is in this world. Because the Antichrist is the antithesis of Jesus Christ. So the first and most important for us to understand and to believe in is Jesus Christ, of course. But second to that, especially if we live in these days as we do, just before Jesus comes back second time, we must know who his enemy is. And that's the Antichrist. So no excuse for my part to take up this topic. I'm sure if God will save, you, save me one day, uh, some people on the other side will thank me for taking up these topics again and again because we speak far too little about it, far too little. And I wish I could speak about other things often when I travel around in churches. I would like to speak about sweet things, comforted things, nice things all the time. But as long as there are so few speaking about these things, I'm not saying I'm the only one speaking about it, but there are too few speaking about it because these are powerful arguments to lead people to join the end time church. Compelling evidence, I would say. Here is this terrible little horn. And uh, if we go back to the early Christians, Irenaeus, for instance, he lived in the second century, second, two generations after Christ, two or three generations after Christ. And he was one of the leading Christians in the, in the Western church, although he wrote in Greek, but he, was, he lived there in the Western part of the, of the Roman Empire. And uh, he said the following, in a still clearer light has John in the Apocalypse indicated to the Lord's disciples what shall happen in the last times. And concerning the 10 kings, who shall then arise, among whom the empire, which no rules, that's the Roman Empire, of course, shall be partioned. So in other words, this guy, hundreds of years before Rome collapsed, he said, the Roman Empire will be divided into 10 parts. He said it hundreds of, of years before it happened. Then the 10 toes, which we studied last time, therefore are these 10 kings, among whom the kingdom shall be partioned. For when he, Antichrist, is come and of his accord concentrates in his own person, the apostasy sitting also in the temple of God. That's Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the other very clear statement of the Antichrist in the Bible. So that his dupes may adore him as the Christ. 
whose coming John has thus described in the apocalypse. And the beast which I had seen was like unto a leopard and his feet as of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon conferred his own power upon him and his throne and great might. This is actually the Antichrist. This is, this is the beast in Revelation. And you've heard about the mark of the beast. You know that everyone who receives the mark of the beast will be lost. So those who will be saved of the living ones just before Jesus Christ comes are those who do not receive the mark of the beast. Wouldn't you be interested to know who the beast is? So you don't take the mark of the beast. Of course, anyone would think like that. So here Irenaeus says that this beast in Revelation who has the mark of the beast, he is actually composed of animals taken from the book of Daniel. Leopard, bear, and lion. It's exactly the animals in chapter 7. So you see that Daniel and Revelation, they belong together. And we need Daniel to understand the book of Revelation. There is also another and a greater necessity for our, and this is Tertullian. He was a lawyer in the, in the, in the second century. And he was a, a great Latin writer, a defender of the faith. And uh, a very, very smart guy. You know what he wrote? Just a couple of generations after Christ, maybe three or four, there is also another and a greater necessity for our offering prayer in behalf of the emperors. Nay, for the complete stability of the empire and for Roman interest in general. For we know that the mighty shock impending over the whole earth, in fact, the very end of all things, threatening dreadful woes. So when he says we should pray for the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire, they persecuted Christians. But in the thinking of Tertullian, he knew that what would come after the Roman Empire would be much worse than the Roman Empire. So therefore, he encouraged the Christians to pray for the Roman Empire, to let it preserve, to, to, to continue, because what will come after the Roman Empire will be deadly, deadly dangerous, only retarded by the continual existence of the Roman Empire. We have no desire then to be overtaken by these dire events, and in praying that their coming may be delayed, we are land, lending our aid to Rome's duration. So he knew that the Antichrist was coming after the Roman Empire had collapsed. And it, it wouldn't collapse until two, two, 200 years after Tertullian. So he, he said, let's pray for the Roman Empire to continue. He also wrote in another place, rejoice, blessed Daniel. No, that's another one. That's Hippolytus. And I mentioned him yesterday evening. He was one of the competing popes in Rome, but he was the first to write the commentary, a full commentary on the book of Daniel. And uh, he says the following, Rejoice, blessed Daniel. Thou hast not been in error. All these things have come to pass. After this again, those have, thou hast told me of the beast, dreadful and terrible. It had iron teeth and claws and bra of brass. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. Already the iron rules, and that's the Roman Empire. And he lived in the 200s, in the 200s, more than 100 years before Rome broke up into many pieces. Already the iron rules, already it subdues and breaks all in pieces. Already it brings all the unwilling into subjection. Already we see these things ourselves. Now we glorify God being instructed by thee. So here we have the prophecies in Daniel telling us that these four animals will come up. They represent Babylon, Medio Persia, Greece, and the Roman Empire. The prophecy said, tells us that when Rome breaks up into 10 parts. In between those parts will come up the Antichrist, the enemy of Jesus Christ, the Antichrist, the antithesis of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that, shouldn't that be an obligation to us to know exactly who this power is? 
I think it pleases Jesus for us to know it. We shouldn't focus on this. And of course, Jesus Christ is our Lord and, 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 and Savior. He is the one we should focus on. And Alan had a fantastic meeting uh, uh, this morning about Daniel 9. And uh, this is wonderful to lift up Jesus, exalt him above everything. He is, he is what we need more than anything else. And when we speak about Jesus, we speak about how the Bible describes Jesus. When we speak about the words of Jesus that we're supposed to believe in, we speak about the words of the Bible. Because Jesus is even called the word of God in Revelation chapter 19. That's his name, the word of God. So we cannot separate the Bible from Jesus Christ. There was a rebellion against Jesus in heaven a long time ago. At that time, Jesus wasn't called Jesus. He was called Michael, Michael. And Lucifer was the second highest in, in the heavenly hierarchy. And he, he rebelled. He was envy. He was proud. He was warned by God, but he resisted the warnings and he made a rebellion and he, he, he started something terrible and God had to squeeze him out of, of paradise and uh, he is in the earth and, and this is the testing ground and we are in the middle of a warfare between good and evil. It's, it's on this planet. This is the only planet in the world that, that, that has this warfare between good and evil presently all the other inhabited planets in the universe trillions of them they are in perfect harmony with god in perfect harmony with the law of god but this planet is in rebellion and this is the prince of this world satan and he hates everything that has to do with god and there are three things he hates especially and that is god god's word and that is God's law. And when I say God, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, the holy, the holy trio, the heavenly trio, as El Might calls it. And uh, when I, when I, uh, when I say these things, I, I, I need to mention the third thing he hates because he hates God, and he hates the word of God, the law of God, and he hates God's people. These are the three. He hates more than anything else. And uh, the law of God, of course, he hates and he has trampled on it. The great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. Daniel 7 verse 17 says, it's an explanation of what has been uh, taught so far. So these great four animals, they are four kings. Four kings, aren't they empires? Yes, verse 23 says, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. I need to tell you a story, although time is running quickly. I, I feel, compared to Alan and I, I feel time is running much more faster for me. I, 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 but uh, I need to say this very important message, and that is, there was a crisis in the 1500s and uh, the world, uh, Europe, was in great darkness. It was the end of the Middle Ages. And uh, one uh, very interesting thing happened in the beginning of the 1500s. A man by the name of Martin Luther, he discovered in the Bible uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He understood that he didn't need to go through a system a human system to be to be saved. He just had to come to Jesus Christ and uh, there surrender to him. There was also something else he understood. He understood that that church that he had belonged to, the Catholic church was actually exposed in the Bible as the Antichrist. He found this in the book of Daniel and he became convinced about it after two or three years after the Ignatian, after the, the Reformation began in, in 1517. In 1520, he was completely, completely convinced that the papal Rome was, uh, was the fulfillment of the Antichrist prophecies in the Bible. And he used the book of Daniel 
and he used what we call the Protestant method of interpretation. It's called historicism. That is, they take you take the whole history, and uh, and uh, the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation they cover all of history, from the time of the prophets until the time of Jesus' second coming. So the whole scope of history is a source of fulfillment in Daniel and Revelation. And as Martin Luther read through these prophecies in Daniel, he, 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 he traveled through world history from the time of Daniel until Jesus' second coming. And who did he come across? He came across the Antichrist, of course, because the Antichrist is exposed in the book of Daniel and also in the book of Revelation. So that historicist system of prophetic interpretation helped Martin Luther to see that force who opposed the God of heaven and Jesus Christ. The Catholic Church, of course, were humiliated by this, and their theologians couldn't really answer the, the, the objections to Martin Luther and the reformers. So uh, a church meeting was set up called the Trent Council from uh, 1545 to 1563. They met in several sessions. And the object of this ecumenical council was to find a way to hit back to the Protestants because the Protestants and Martin Luther had divided Europe. So the countries north of the Alps was now Protestant. They wouldn't listen to the Pope anymore. They wouldn't send any money to the Pope anymore. So this was an inc incredible loss for the Roman Catholic Church. So they made this church meeting. And the Jesuits, that very special order in the Catholic Church, were um, spearheading this uh, council. And after that council, the Jesuit decided to, uh, to win back lost territory, to hit back on the Protestants. So they came up with another way of reading Daniel and Revelation, especially the book of Revelation. And they took away from the reading of the book of Revelation, Revelation and Daniel, they took away the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages, they just took away and they said, one of them said, uh, the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation, they end up at the, uh, before the Roman Empire collapse. After that, there is no fulfillment until just before Jesus comes back second time. So there is an interval of thousand years for those living 500 years ago, an interval of thousand years in history where there is no prophetic fulfillment of course the protestants when they heard these new arguments they just laughed and shake their heads and felt no this is no problem we we, we don't believe in that it doesn't it's not true uh, and one of their main arguments the jesuits main argument there were two there were three arguments they had three arguments in order to prove that the protestants were wrong when they accused the the, the papacy of being the antichrist the three arguments were the following. All of history is not described in Daniel and Revelation. It's only described until the fall of the Roman Empire, 500 years after Christ, and a very short time before Jesus' second coming. So church history after the fall of the Roman Empire, after 500 approximately, is not described in Daniel or in the book of Revelation. So that premise was very important to them, both futurism and preterism, as we call these two new systems. They are very careful to defining this hermeneutic that church history is not part of the fulfillment of Daniel and Revelation. This, uh, this was one thing. And also the second part is that they believed that the Antichrist was supposed to be one single person. And that one single person hadn't appeared. Because when uh, the Roman Empire uh, collapsed, then uh, people uh, in those days, they were looking for that person who, who, who would come to rule for 42 months. 
and uh, this Antichrist who would come up among the ten horns and they expected to see that Antichrist, they didn't see it. So they felt, okay, we were wrong and they didn't understand what we today call the year day principle. So the Catholics in the 1500s, the Jesuits, they argued that according to the Bible, the Antichrist is a person and he is described as a person in First Thessalon in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. He is described as a person here in Daniel chapter 7 and in Revelation chapter 13, he is a person. And to make their argument more compelling, they stated that uh, this person was to rule only for 42 months. It's not a, a kingdom. It's not an empire. It's not a, a, a group of many people, but it's one single people, one single person. That was their main argument, these two. And in addition to the year day principle, there is no year day principle. One day is one day. So therefore, the papacy is not the Antichrist. And the evidence against that thesis is just here before you on the screen. Because the Bible says that these four animals, these four beasts, which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth. So these animals, they are described in Daniel as kings, as individual persons. You can imagine four kings coming up from the sea, one, four single people coming up. So each single person is a beast and it's represented as a person. And then in verse 23, Daniel says, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. What does that mean? It means that a person, a king, is a symbol of a kingdom, of an empire. So therefore, when the Antichrist is described as a person in the Bible, it doesn't mean that, that it signifies a, sig a, 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 a singular person. It's, it represents a group of persons, a system, and therefore, it fits extremely well to the papal Rome. So these four animals were symbols of four great empires, the fourth the Roman Empire. And on it, ten horns, the barbarian tribes coming from the north, and in the midst of them, that little horn, speaking great words, eyes like an eye of a person, and uh, and persecuting God's people, that little horn lasting for 1,260 symbolic days. And uh, it came up there after the fall of the Roman Empire. It came up to power after the fall of the Roman Empire. It had existed for some time, but it was in union with the Roman Empire that this little horn received much power, much prestige, and, 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 and was able to tyrannize the civilization of Europe for more than a thousand years. Thus, I must read my own Bible because there is something uh, covering the text here. I don't know how to get it uh, away. No, I can't. Uh, so I read from my Bible, verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth trample it and break it in pieces so no question this is the roman empire and actually all bible most bible believing christians regardless of the denomination they belong to they actually believe that the fourth animal is the roman empire and uh, there is uh, even Catholics believe that. So, so uh, Pentecostals, Charismatics, solid Bible believing Baptists, anyone who has a firm faith in the word of God believe that the fourth empire is the Roman Empire. But then they believe in this interval of more than a thousand years. So I'm trying to get forward here, yeah. And the animal here is Babylon, stretching from, uh, from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf. 
from 605 to 539. The bear is the next power uh, empire. Read, read world history. This is just the most basic, basic bird eye view church, uh, world history you can imagine. But it's correct. Written thousand, more than thousand years before before it happened. We can trust the word of God. Then we have the Medio Persian Empire from 539 to 331, and then the third one, uh, Alexander the Great Kingdom that was divided into four, and uh, later called the Hellenistic Empire, and uh, it stretched from uh, from the Adriatic Sea until uh, India extremely big empire and then verse 23 uh, sorry i thus verse 23 thus the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devote the whole earth and so forth and then verse 24 the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Here we have the Antichrist. Here we have the Antichrist. And the Roman Empire extended from the Atlantic Sea till the, to, the, to the Persian Gulf. Uh, and uh, it was an enormous empire. And we saw it last time in form of that figure. We are living now in the last days, just before Jesus comes back. This is a map of Europe, uh, 100, 200 years after Christ, long time before the Roman Empire uh, collapsed. Can you see it there with Denmark? Can you see the Heroli is there? Jonathan had a, Nathanael had a wonderful question yesterday that we will try to answer on Monday. And we have the Saxons. They moved over to England, the Anglo and Saxons. And then we have the Gutunes, Burgundians, and uh, we have different, uh, different uh, tribes that at this time were behind or they were beyond the, the rivers of Rhine and Danube. But in the, in the fourth, especially in the fifth, century they moved across these rivers that divided the roman empire from the barbarians and then suddenly the roman empire was changed forever changed and uh, and the roman empire looked like that in the fifth century you see the gods dominated around italy then in spain you have the the visigoths called the west gods and then uh, the Franks, a little north of that, we have the Swifts in there where we have Portugal, and then the Anglo-Saxons in England, and so forth. So these tribes were about 10. Here is another map of, of the tribes of, of Europe in the 5th century that changed the map of Europe. And these 10 tribes, we can discuss who these 10 tribes are, but there are 10 tribes, or we can say nine tribes, 10, 11, 12 tribes, but God chose number 10, 10 because it's the number of tests, and these 10 tribes were testing the Roman Empire to it, its limits, and it collapsed completely. Exactly like the Bible said 1,000 years before, 10 horns would come up in that empire, and many have tried to to gather these 10 tribes in Europe afterwards. I'm thinking about Charlemagne, Wilhelm the, the Second, Napoleon, and Hitler. Hitler stated, I was Europe's last chance. He had a dream of uniting Europe for all ages, 1,000 years ahead of us. Today, European Union is the last attempt to unite Europe, but it fails, it fails. England is out and several other countries are out and uh, they don't have the same uh, monetary system. They don't have the same language, these nations here. They have only one thing in common and that's Christianity. That's Christianity. So these four animals represents the empires from the day of Daniel until our time and the Roman time.
And this little horn is the papacy. There is no other, no other candidate, to be honest with you. It is the papacy. No other candidate fulfills all the specifications in the prophecy. Here in verse 25, it's a detailed description of that little horn. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, Daniel says, shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Here we have four very, very foundational characteristics to that new power on the arena called the little horn. It's the same as the Antichrist. First, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, blasphemies from this power. And you know, as I know, that the Pope in Rome, he calls himself the Vicar of Christ. He's, he, he, he comes up with statements that are shocking the Protestant world these days. You know, he's thanking Mary for protecting them for the coronavirus. And they... And, and, and they encourage people to, talk, to, to, to pray or to, to give their attention to Mary as, uh, and, and tell people that she will help us. Instead of coming to Jesus Christ, they go to Mary. And uh, the Pope has so many statements about himself that, that is of a, of a blasphemous nature. And I will not go into it. I, I, we, we could speak a lot about it. Then the next one, he shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Has the papacy persecuted the saints of the Most High? Indeed. I don't know the number of it, but the, the Inquisition killed millions. And there are museums in, in, in Western, Southern Europe, uh, museums reminding us about the, 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 the torture tools they use uh, and it was a terrible time in Europe from the 1200s, 1300s when, when this institution uh, ruled over Europe, much of Europe, horrible things happened and it has been a persecuting power and uh, much could be said here. This is that representative of this anti-Christian system that persecuted people throughout history and also has attempted to change the law of God. And this is very, very, very interesting that they boast about it in their catechisms. They actually state explicitly that they have changed the law of God from Sabbath to Sunday. And one statement actually says that Sunday keeping is the mark of Catholic authority. So you see, the Bible has exposed the devil and he has worked with one human institution in this world to forward his, his plans, his deceptions. And that system we call the papacy has been very faithful to, to the commission from Satan unfortunately and uh, we talked about that last time when when rome collapsed and all these things so if you see the timeline here this is daniel 7 the time of the prophet approximately five six hundred years before christ and then the line goes all the way to the time of jesus second coming it goes all the way and when we go to the book of revelation time of the prophet is around the time of christ the first century and it goes all the way to the second coming. And then we have Revelation 12. It goes all the way from the time of the prophet, first century, all the way to Jesus' second coming. So in order to, to make Daniel and Revelation sensible, we need to understand the year-day principle. And I should really go through it, but it takes quite some time. So I have to do that at another time. Although I, Alan uh, suggested it this morning that uh, I should explain it, but uh, we, there is no time for it. I've always, oh, I've all, oh, I've, I've used up my time already. But I just want you to 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 
to understand that there are good arguments that one day in uh, symbolic apocalyptic biblical writings represents one year. There are very, very good arguments for it. And therefore, Jewish believers, non-Christian Jewish believers, believed it for hundreds and hundreds of years. Even before the time of Christ, people believed in the year-day principle. And one prophecy Alan explains nicely this morning was the 70 weeks. Only the year-day principle can explain the 70 weeks. And I've just, I just read the, 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 the bold uh, statements. The short time periods in apocalyptic prophecy indicate symbolic interpretation. Time prophecies in apocalyptic literature overlaps kingdoms and empires. It cannot be one day for one year, uh, for one day. It must be one day for one year. Old Testament hints at the year-day principle. Year-day principle is, is found in Hebrew parallelism. Year-day principle explicitly mentioned in the Pentateuch. Ezekiel mentioned year day principle explicitly. Bible scholars of all persuasions admit the year day principles in Daniel chapter 9. And there is a pragmatic test. There was two guys living around 1700, Kressner and Fleming. And you know, they both prophesied that the little horn, the Antichrist, would rule for 1260 years. And they, 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 they realized that it had to start around 530s with Justinian's rule. And therefore they predicted that the papacy would collapse in around 1800. Today we know it was in 1798 when the Pope was taken prison. So these lines of history from the time of the prophet until the time of the second coming is understandable when we put the year day principle into it because the Antichrist was supposed to, 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 to exist for Hamas then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. And this is acknowledged by most Bible scholars as three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days. But when we apply the year-day principle, which is a 100% biblical principle, then these, these lines will be understandable. Because 1,260 days equals 1,260 years. And at the end of the Roman Empire, we start these days. As a matter of fact, we start them in 538 because that was a significant starting point for, 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 for the Roman papacy. Uh, it existed before it, but there was a special union between the emperor and the papacy at that time. 538 until 1798. So when we study Daniel 7, we know what's before and we know what's after. And there would be a judgment, it says, after 1798. And that's the investigative judgment. We know it must be after 1798 because we know the year day principle and we know the papacy or the, and the Antichrist would rule for 1260 years. So we know it is after 1798. The end of time started in 1798, as a matter of fact. And when we come to Daniel chapter 11, there is a very great detailed description of what happens after 1798. So this will come when we go to Revelation chapter 11, when we place this period of 1260 years, we can see that things are much easier to understand. So we know what we, we can read the Bible, what's happening before 538. We can read the Bible, what happened after 1798. So it is a historical reference point for us. And it makes things so much easier to understand in Daniel and Revelation when we understand the year-day principle. And when we understand that the Antichrist is not a single person, but uh, uh, a, a composite body of people stretching over long time, 538 until 12, 1260. We could spend an hour explaining what happened in 538. And what happened in 1798, that's also for another time. But it's very essential for us to understand these things. And when we study the book of Revelation and the mark of the beast and these new corona times that will come, that will be 10 times worse than we experience today. You know, it's good to know these things. It's a good preparation. You know what Newton said? He was eager student of the prophecies. He said, 
if God was so angry with the Jews for not searching more diligently into the prophecies which he had given them to know Christ by, why should we think he will excuse us for not searching the prophecies which he has given us to know Antichrist by? So to prepare for the end time, the last days of the end, end time, is actually to study Daniel and Revelation. That's one very, very important way of preparing for the last days. Because when we are going out in, into a war, if you are going called to, to participate in war against some evil forces, and you don't even know who the evil forces are, how could, how could Norway send out troops to conquer the Nazis in the Second World War if we didn't know that the Nazis were our enemies? So therefore, it's very foundational for Christians to know these things. Martin Luther knew who the Antichrist was, and he, 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 he was very forceful about it. All the guys around him, here, all the main characters of the Reformation, they agreed with him that the papacy is the Antichrist. There was one thing they all agreed on. That is that that was that the papacy must be the Antichrist. That was the the single the single point they all united around. Of course, they believed in sola scriptura. They believed in righteousness by faith, but there were ni nuances there. But when it comes to the Antichrist, they had an identical understanding of the Antichrist being the Pope of Rome. And why is this so important that I mention these things? Because the book of Revelation says that after the papacy received the death blow in 1798, it says in Revelation, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. So sometime after 1798, actually the times we are living in now, there will be a revival in the Catholic Church and the papacy will come up to its former glory. And this, the very scary thing is that we can already see it today. A few years ago, there was this holy alliance between the president of the United States and Pope John Paul II, Ronald Reagan and John Paul II. And everyone agreed that there was a conspiracy to to, to attack the Soviet empire, to get rid of it completely. And the Pope was from Poland. He used solidarity, that uh, trade union. And uh, he used all his intrigues and all his, his, his smartness to, to and, and he worked with Ronald Reagan. And, and this Time Magazine article stated that weekly, they spoke about how to conquer the Soviet empire. And they did it together, America and the papacy. And also recently, the Pope has allied himself with the Protestants in America. Here are some of the charismatic leading Protestants in America. And they have stretched their hand over to the Pope. And they are so happy for the Pope. You know, 15 years ago, these guys here, they said that the papacy is the prostitute of Revelation chapter 17. They said that the papacy was, 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 was an agent for the, for the evil one. Today, Kenneth Copeland standing uh, at the right side of the Pope, he even says that the Pope is his favorite Christian in the world. He is so, he, he is so dedicated to the Pope, this Protestant, allegedly. So we are actually living just before Jesus comes back. Anything can happen these days. And when I show you this picture, I usually say, this is the vicar of Christ, he calls himself. And uh, you know the antithesis of the vicar of Christ. The antithesis is actually Jesus Christ. Oh, there are many differences between these two. They represent two different systems. Here, a system which is in rebellion against the law of God, the word of God, the gospel of God, everything. Here is the true master of life, master of history, the ruler of the universe, Jesus Christ, our King and our Savior. And you know, it honors and glorifies Jesus Christ when we study the prophecies. 
so that we know we have a we have a certain knowledge about what we can expect in the future after after these things there will be a judgment after the death blow in 1798 there will be a judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion and this little horn will be destroyed forever and ever and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom of the, under the whole heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him daniel has spoken about all these kingdoms these empires they had their times and influence and corruptions and all these things but there will be an empire that will never end an empire of love an empire of light an empire of happiness and that's the kingdom of god and one day jesus will come back and we will see him in the sky and he will comfort us oh these are special times we are going into may god help us to know how we shall do to prepare for that time we must we must come together we must surrender completely to god we must remove ourselves more and more from the world and we must we must think about these things shall we pray together no and remember that god can comfort us it looks dark sometimes but there is actually a sun shining behind the clouds jesus christ he is he has full control he is our perfect savior and he will fulfill his mission he will come back he will save you and me if we are faithful may god help us dear father in heaven thank you so much for your word thank you for this message that we and help us to be encouraged to prepare for these last days of the end of time help us to do the right things help us to read spirit of prophecy help us to be more dedicated to work more closely with you and invite your spirit into our hearts so that we can so that we can show the love to our next door neighbors and those we meet Bless us, bless Madison School, bless all of us. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.